Thanks very much. I'm delighted to be here and share with you some of this uh, rather depressing information. Uh, <laughs> the book and the talk sort of follows the book. The, the approach I take is different kinds of pollution taken one at a time. And for each kind of pollution, where it comes from, what it does, and what might we be able to do about it. So those are sort of three aspects for each type of pollution. The first type of pollution that I'm going to talk about is what we call eutrophication, which is basically too much of a good thing. Uh, it, nutrients, everybody knows you need nutrients. Nutrients are essential for life. And uh, two major nutrients are nitrogen and phosphorus, and we need that in our food. But when too much of it gets into the water, it can cause problems. Um, in marine and estuarine environments, it's nitrogen is the major problem. The major sources of this include human wastes from septic tanks, from sewage treatment, also wastes from farms like fertilizers and manure. When there's too much, it goes into the water and can cause problems. In urban areas such as New York City, older cities, where there are what's called combined sewer systems. What that means is that the sewer system, let me see if I can get a pointer here. The sewage from houses or industries, uh, you can hear me? This is the microphone. Yeah, okay. Uh, coming down from the toilet or the sink, whatever. Can't, can't hear you. Can't hear. All right. We'll leave it with I'll take this here with me. Okay, I think I can take this one with me. This is all right. This one here doesn't have a wire. It's easier. Okay, um, all right. Let's go, let's go here. This, the pollution, the sewage comes here, goes down the pipe to a sewage treatment plant. They thought, and it was a really good idea at the time when they built the systems, that the wastewater from storms going down storm drains, instead of going right out to the water because it would pick up pollutants on the way going down the street. It would pick up horse manure, dog manure, whatever. Let's connect that to the sewer system. So they connected the storm sewers to these sewers, and together it would go to the sewage treatment plant, which worked fine for a time. It worked fine for most of the 20th century. But during that 20th century, the population living in the city grew enormously. And so that the amount coming down from the homes and businesses was a lot more than it used to be. And the sewage treatment plant had a certain capacity that it could take. And it began to be such that on a dry day, everything was fine. But if you had a lot not even a whole lot, a moderate amount of rain, you'd get all this extra water coming in from here in addition to all this water coming to the sewage treatment plant. And it was too much for the sewage treatment plant to cope with. It had a certain volume of water it could deal with, and now it was too much because the population had grown so much. So when it can't go into the sewage treatment plant, it backs up, and instead of backing up into your toilet or your bathtub, they decided to put an extra pipe here so that it could all go back out to the water. So what that means is that on a moderately rainy day, it overwhelms the sewage treatment plant, and so that sewage, as well as the stormwater, go directly out into the water without treatment. So that's what they call combined sewer overflow. And it's the major 
problem, nutrient problem in urban areas, combined sewer overflow. Um, okay. And that's, you know, it's not very pretty to look at when this has happened. This goes into, it's in the Hudson River, it's in the East River. It, you know, it, it doesn't have to have an enormous amount of rain to have combined sewer overflow. Okay, there's also sources from agriculture. The agricultural sources are primarily fertilizer and animal waste. Uh, and, and the uh, amount of animals used on a large, big ag type farm is far more than the, the land there can absorb the manure. So there's a lot of runoff of manure into creeks, and what goes into creeks goes into streams, goes into rivers. It all, the estuary in the ocean is, is, is at the end of all of this. So it runs off. There's also atmospheric sources. Uh, when you have uh, burning fuel, gas, oil, whatever, the gases from fossil fuels go into the atmosphere and eventually will come down in the rain. And when it comes down in rain, it gets deposited on land and in the water. Another source is urban runoff. Lawn fertilizers and such, I should say urban and suburban uh, runoff. And when it rains, and it, uh, rain is hitting impervious surfaces, that's roads, sidewalks, parking lots, it can't sink into the ground the way it could if it's hitting open land, park land, forests, grasslands, what, whatever. The impervious surfaces that are predominant in cities and suburbs uh, prevent the, the water from soaking in the land, so it runs off and it picks up pollution on the way into the water. So the take home message here is that land use plays a big role in water pollution. Okay, now we get to the thing of, so what does it do? What it does, here's, here's your inflow uh, of, of uh, runoff and sewage into the water. It stimulates, as nutrients will do, plant growth. And we're talking here about growth of tiny single-celled plants called phytoplankton or single-celled algae. They get fertilized by this and they grow. And you get a bloom. Sounds very good, a bloom, right? Well, but, whoops. Um, in too much, nutrients means too big a bloom. It may grow so much to discolor the water. And if you look at the water and it looks like pea soup, you know there's something wrong. And here you've got a situation where algae are blooming out of control. And this big bloom can't sustain itself and they eventually die. So here we have the dying algae sinking to the bottom. They sink down to the bottom and then they are decayed. Bacteria cause decay. And bacteria in doing the decay use up oxygen. So we end up with a problem that we call hypoxia, which means low oxygen. And that's what, why does this keep blinking? I don't, I'm not doing anything, am I? Anyway, it keeps, it, down in the lower water, the oxygen goes down. The fish will leave if they can go and hope to find some place where the oxygen is better. The slower moving animals on the bottom may not be able to get away and uh, may die. If it's not low enough to cause them to die, they're still in bad shape. They can't eat well, they can't move well, they can't grow well. So it causes a um, great deal of, uh, of damage. That's low oxygen or hypoxia. Um, there are areas that are called dead zones that are around the world. Uh, and they're associated with excess nitrogen from fertilizers and sewage coming into the area. The biggest of these dead zones in this country, I'll push the wrong one, 
is in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see on the map the little, uh, here it is big, here it is on the map. They refer to this, they call it, some years it's the size of Massachusetts, some years it's worse, it's the size of New Jersey. And this is a vast area of the ocean, or the, of the Gulf of Mexico, where there's not enough oxygen for most life to exist. There may be just some bacteria, but you won't find fish, you won't find uh, other, other marine animals living there, because the oxygen is too low. Now, why is this one so bad? You think of what's coming into the Gulf of Mexico. We have the Mississippi River coming into the Gulf of Mexico. The Mississippi River is receiving tributaries from all of these states. This is the breadbasket of the U.S. This is the big agricultural area of the U.S. These rivers and streams are loaded with fertilizer that's run off from all the farms. It's coming together to the Mississippi and getting dumped into the Gulf of Mexico, and hence you have this large dead zone. The dead zone is largest in years with a lot of rain. It all got, comes back to rain and runoff of the fertilizer. On a dry year, you have less rain, less runoff, a smaller dead zone. Not near us, but further south, we have coral reefs that are also in big trouble because of excess nutrients and this eutrophication. The excess nutrients cause other kinds of algae to overgrow the corals and cover them. And you see on, on the right side here, it's green, bluish green. That algae has covered that coral. This is what the coral looked like originally. Here it is, covered with algae because the algae was stimulated to grow by the nutrients coming in. If you have a lot of animals around that eat that algae, things like sea urchins, things like certain species of fish could eat that algae, they may be able to keep the thing under control. But if your fish are in bad, if you've overfished, for example, and you don't have many of those fish around, then your, uh, your coral reef is in bigger trouble uh, from getting their algae overgrown uh, getting the coral overgrown by algae. Another problem that happens with algae, with, with in, in this case certain species of single-celled algae, is that certain of these species are produce toxins, and they're the ones on the left side here. There are certain species of single-celled algae that produce toxins that may either be released into the water and cause problems, or may only cause problems for animals that eat these algae. And, and they're showing in this picture several different ones. There are many more. And, and as time goes on, people keep finding new species that are producing these toxins that are, um, are harmful. There are, there's one that happens around here. That's the one here. It's called PSP, paralytic shellfish poisoning. Why shellfish? What happens is shellfish, like clams and oysters, will eat their filter feeders. They the water gets pumped through their systems, and they filter out algae from the water. And if these toxic species of algae happen to be around, they eat them just as much as anything else. And they can store the toxin in their tissues. It doesn't kill them. It impairs them somewhat, but they, they can survive. And they can manage to store up pretty high quantities of the toxin from these algae. And then if you or any unlucky person should happen to eat some of those oysters or clams or mussels, then you get very sick. So um, this is a human health issue. Um, what is done is that the beds of uh, these shellfish that are harvested for people to eat are monitored regularly and tested to see if these toxins have uh, been accumulating there or not. And if, if they find 
over a certain level of the toxin from these um, algae, they will close the bed so that very few incidents of, of paralytic shellfish poisoning happen. Uh, but there are some of these other species that are rarer, and uh, people have died from eating too much shellfish that have accumulated some of these uh, toxins. Uh, so now the next part is what can we do about it? Well, we can reduce the input of these uh, nutrients, nitrogen, for example, from agriculture. There are various agricultural techniques, uh, conservation, tillage, terracing, contour, cropping. Uh, here's an example um, here. Oh, I'm pushing the wrong button. Uh, sorry. Uh, let's, let's go back a little bit. Um, this picture here, you see, the, here's a creek going along here, and here is some crop, some shrubbery growing right at the edge of the creek, and here's the farm field. So what they did was they planted this plant so that when there is rain and runoff, this is, this is not the crop, this is trapping the nutrients that are running in and preventing them from getting into the creek. So things like that, uh, and there's a whole slew of them that have been known and done for many years. Um, that's called a buffer strip of vegetation, and it catches the runoff and prevents it from getting into the creek. Uh, of course, it's also possible to reduce the use of fertilizers. Uh, farmers tend to use far more fertilizer than is necessary. A small fraction of the fertilizer actually gets into the plant and, and more than half of it ends up running off. Um, so there are many things that farmers can do. Um, the problem is it's all voluntary. Uh, another thing that can be done is restoring or creating wetlands that will also serve as a, a larger than that buffer strip, but the same idea, the wetlands will absorb the nutrients and help the wetland plants grow instead of going into uh, the water body and causing eutrophication. Urban management, what can we do about this sewer problem, this combined sewer? Well, it's possible to do um, tertiary treatment to improve the sewage treatment, also wetlands, reduce the, you know, the amount of impervious areas, reduce erosion from construction sites, and the thing that has become quite popular these days and really needs to be magnified greatly is storing stormwater. If you can have less stormwater running off into the storm sewer and collect it somewhere uh, and hold it, and then slowly, after the rain is over, slowly feed it back into the system, this would solve it. If you could make some large humongous pool somewhere to just hold it. But there are even better ideas. There's green infrastructure. And there's a bunch of these things that are referred to as green infrastructure. Um, they can make things like bioswales or rain gardens. Uh, this is just, you know, dirt and plants instead of concrete, instead of asphalt. So here they, these, these Bioswales are put near curbs on streets, and it's greenery, and it makes it prettier, and it absorbs a lot of the water that would otherwise have washed down the sewer into the water. Uh, there are rooftop green roofs, and we have one in New York City on top of the Javits Center, which is a big convention center on the far west side of Manhattan. Um, then smaller scale, rain barrels. People can have a rain barrel in their garden and then tap off the water uh, to water their, water their garden you know, the next week when it's not raining. Uh, and there's also a thing called porous pavement, uh, which is a constructed thing which will absorb a fair amount of water instead of the normal pavement that absorbs no water. And then it stores it for a while and then feeds it back to get back into the water system. So there are lots of ways to store stormwater. And New York City is doing a lot of this. 
Uh, they're not doing it as much and as fast as a lot of us would like, but you know, it costs money to do these things, of course. Even in the water, it's possible to do things to uh, reduce this. You can grow, see, have seaweed farms. Here, this is a seaweed farm. Uh, they have some in Long Island Sound, off the coast of Stamford, I think, somewhere in Connecticut. Um, this seaweed farm, will, the seaweed will absorb the nutrients, and then you can harvest it and make, use it in sushi or, or you know, other, other thing you can, uh, things you can do with it. Also, shellfish, growing oysters and clams, they're not going to absorb the nutrients, but they will eat some of the plankton that are blooming and reduce the size of a plankton bloom. And then there are also treatment wetlands that will um, have plants to absorb the nutrients. So even once you're in the water, it's not necessarily too late. It's possible to do something to reduce eutrophication, even uh, systems in the water. Uh, overall, things are getting worse. Eutrophication worldwide is getting worse in the US and worldwide. Areas of progress that we've seen are mostly in terms of improvement of sewage treatment plants and combined sewer overflow issues. There is less improvement on the non-point source runoff, that is runoff from fields and agriculture and that. Uh, harmful algal blooms are increasing in frequency and also they keep finding new species that they had not known about before. Another thing that makes problem for politicians is that recovery time may be very long. You do something to fix it, the politician wants to see a difference by next year. That's not going to happen. There is a long lag period here. So you can spend a lot of money to fix something and not see an improvement in possibly a decade. So that is a hard thing to convince a politician on. But that's, that's the bitter truth about this. Uh, some good news, our oxygen levels around New York are better and we've got whales around New York. So things that were really awful in the 70s and 80s have improved, but things that were really good in the 70s and 80s have got, uh, gone down. Okay, another Switching to another type of pollution, it's got many names. We can call it marine debris, we can call it litter, we can call it trash, we can call it solid waste, garbage. Take your pick, it's all the same stuff. And it's mostly plastic. And you've probably all seen pictures like this of some beach piled up with litter, debris, plastic, whatever you want to call it. It's really ugly. I don't have to convince you how ugly it is. But it's also harmful. It's not just a matter of being ugly. Marine animals are getting killed by this stuff. One major way they're getting killed is by getting entangled in it, like this turtle here, or the uh, seal and the bird here. They can get entangled in the plastic. Another way they are damaged by it or killed by it is by eating it, and we've got here a turtle in the process of eating a plastic bag. Uh, we have opened, animals have been opened up. I've got more of this later. Here, this is a dead bird opened up, a carcass. You can see sort of the wings here. This is a baby bird. And if you look here, it's full of plastic. The um, albatrosses in the Pacific Ocean, um, the parent birds pick up plastic and feed it to the baby birds. And who know, they don't know any better, and the baby birds don't know any better, and they eat it and they die. I mean, I can't prove to you that this baby bird died from all the plastic in its stomach, but I think we all know it did. Uh, I mean, it's kind of self-evident that it did. Uh, there's a new paper that just came out last week that coral disease is much more prevalent when there is plastic litter sitting on the coral. The litter apparently is a good way to transfer
disease organisms, germs. Uh, the, the plastic lands on the reef, and that area of the reef has much more disease than an area of the reef that doesn't have plastic on it. So here's something new, a new way for plastic to kill animals. Uh, there is, and perhaps some of you know about this, um, an international beach cleanup, coastal cleanup, run by the Ocean Conservancy every year in September. And they don't only just pick up, they keep excellent records. So there's tons of data. Everyone who goes to pick up stuff on the beach gets a sheet to fill in how many cigarette butts you found, how many pieces of balloon, how many plastic bags, how many bottles, and so forth. So they have excellent data over the years, and, and you find that um, cigarette butts are very common, fishing lines and nets, food wrappers, styrofoam, plastic bottles. The thing about plastic is that it doesn't break down. It breaks up into smaller pieces, but it doesn't break down chemically. Uh, and then there was a report not that long ago, 90% of the seabirds they looked, they analyzed, were eating plastic. So uh, this is, apparently the plastic has some kind of odor attached to it that a lot of marine animals don't just eat it because it's the only thing there. It attracts them to eat it. There was a study done with some animals where they were offered real food and offered pieces of plastic, and they preferred to eat the plastic. Um, so that's, that's not adaptive behavior, but that's what they do. Um, this is just an overall view of how much uh, is going in and where it comes from. I guess the major take-home message is that 10 out of the 13.5 whatever million, whatever it is, let me see, million tons per year, um, 10 of those, 13.5, are coming from land-based. So that, that's where we have to look, is, is on land for um, the, where it's coming from. Here's the common types of plastic on beaches. We find plastic bottles, we find styrofoam, straws, cigarette butts, toys, shoes, balloons. You've probably all seen this. Plastic bottles, I was offered one to have on my dais in case I was thirsty, but I turned it down because I didn't want to be having a plastic bottle. I tried to avoid plastic bottles. You should have a refillable bottle and fill it up and, and not keep buying plastic bottles of water. Bottles take forever to degrade, uh, as, as all plastic doesn't, and they're mostly not recycled. A lot of things that say they're recyclable doesn't guarantee that it actually is recycled, and they don't degrade. Um, styrofoam is one of the worst because it breaks up very readily into small pieces, and it blows in the wind, and it floats in the water, and it, it litters the beaches, and it blows all over the place. Plastic bags. So you see, uh, this is just showing you how a turtle might mistake a plastic bag for a, um, a jellyfish. And they eat them. This is the insides of a dead whale. Whale washed up on a beach, dead. They opened it up, and this is what they found. They found huge amounts, including 30, over 30 huge plastic bags. This was in, in Europe. Um, and that's the insides of that whale's stomach. So again, like that dead bird, can we prove that the whale died from a stomach full of plastic? Probably we can't prove it, but I think we all know it. Balloons. We like to release balloons when there's a celebration. Uh, it may not be a very good idea. They take years to biodegrade, and they kill marine life, too. Uh, we find lots of balloons broken up, not intact, but broken up balloons in the digestive tract of marine life. And then there's cigarette butts, which is the most common if you count individual items. Uh, counting individual items, a cigarette butt is a whole lot smaller than a plastic bottle. But the, the filter material is plastic. 
And it's not only plastic with the problems of plastic, it has all the nasty parts of tobacco stuck onto it. The filter is there to prevent the, the bad stuff, all well, the carcinogenic stuff in the tobacco from getting into your lungs. So now we have the filters with high amounts of toxic stuff on them littering the beaches and getting eaten, of course, by marine animals. And then here's something that you may not have heard of. There is stuff called microplastics. And there, you know, you can see from this penny here, the size there, like a couple, a millimeter, a couple millimeters down to being microscopic. And um, where do they come from? They come from a number of sources. One is the breakdown of bigger things. Secondly, is fibers from our clothing that we wash in washing machines. Uh, clothing releases microfibers too small to get trapped in the washing machine, goes down through sewage treatment plants and into the water. And these microplastics are uh, microplastics that are shaped like a fiber, long, skinny thing, um, is, are, are the most abundant type of microplastics that we find. And then there's this kind that's a sphere that wouldn't come off clothing, that wouldn't um, be a breakdown. That was purposely, those were called microbeads, and they used to be put into personal care products like skin, you know, s abrasive things um, for freshening your skin, getting rid of the dead skin and stuff like that. Um, these were banned in the U.S. a couple years ago, and so they're no longer on the market here. They're probably still on the market some other places. Um, these small pieces of plastic will accumulate uh, in the major, we, there's one called the, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. You may have heard of that. Uh, there are these patches, these areas in all the major oceans. Each ocean has circular currents going around, and in the center where the currents aren't is where all this floating litter accumulates. So you find a greater density of plastic and other litter in those areas. Uh, so um, another problem with the plastic is that they, just like the big pieces, the little pieces get eaten by little animals. The big, the big bar, the balloons and whatever get eaten by bigger animals. The microplastics get eaten by tiny animals, baby fish, uh, little plankton, and so forth. And to make matters worse, like I had mentioned for the corals that germs, my, uh, back, um, disease causing bacteria, attached to them, uh, which is a problem for corals. Chemicals, toxic chemicals that may be in the environment also will attach to the microplastics so that as the fish or the plankton eat them, they are getting uh, not only the plastic itself, but some toxic chemicals as well. So this is a way for toxic chemicals to get into the food chain. All right, a little bit about your clothing, your synthetic clothing. Uh, most of the microplastics we find are microfibers, and they're coming, again, from our synthetic clothing. And one item of clothing can release 100,000 of these tiny fibers uh, in one washing. Uh, and again, they don't get trapped in the washing machine. Sewage plants release perhaps three quarters of them, I, I mean remove, sorry, sewage plants remove about three quarters of them, but that still has many billions going out into the waters every day. Uh, and this is just a microscopic look at tangle of microfibers. Uh, an interesting thing that was found was that front-loading washing machines release much less than top loaders. So if you have a need for a new washing machine 
and you're thinking of buying one and you want to do the right thing by the environment, a front, a front loader would be better. Okay, just looking at this picture, baby fish and small plankton eat the microplastics. I think you can see along here little spheres. This was an experiment in the, in the laboratory. Um, and, and I said before, they seem to um, prefer eating plastics to other things. And uh, most species that have been looked at have found, been found to contain plastic, including the commercial fish species we eat, and of course, the shellfish. So we, if we eat fish or shellfish, we undoubtedly have um, microfibers in, in us as well, microplastics anyway. And another thing, um, talking about health food and all, uh, a lot of people think sea salt is healthier than regular salt. Sea salt, of course, if you evaporate the ocean water and, and have the salt behind, all those plastics are in the salt. So um, your, your healthy sea salt is giving you more microfibers. Okay, summarizing what's going on with marine debris, it's increasing each year despite more cleanups. We need to reduce and recycle plastics and replace single-use plastic bags. And hooray for Suffolk County. Suffolk County did it with plastic bags. You all know that? I was hoping to hear a cheer from you all. Anyway, um, we need to do something about styrofoam as well. We need to refill bottles and not continue buying new plastic bottles for water. Um, and say no to plastic straws. How many have you been to a restaurant, you order a cold drink, and it comes with a straw in it, and you never ask for it, but the straw is there, sitting in the drink? If they would only have a policy of giving straws out only to people who requested it, or you have your own straw, uh, but if you don't happen to have your own straw, try to remember when you order it to tell the, 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 uh, the wait person no straw, please, because that will come even if you don't ask for it. Um, and recovering lost fishing gear. Lost fishing gear is a, is a big problem, and that's not a matter of, of carelessness and not thinking. This is, is stuff that is valuable to the fishermen, and it got torn away in a storm or something. This is not a matter of the fishermen's negligence. It's a bad news for the fishermen as well as for the environment. OK, uh, some more here. We have federal legislation phasing out microbeads. We have, you know, these are these personal care products, some of them that had uh, styrofoam, and then it's not styrofoam, uh, the plastic beads, and then some others that are using natural things. There's plenty of stuff that can be used to um, abrade your skin. Uh, many countries and counties and towns have had bans or fees on plastic bags. Many places are pending. This is happening. It's a movement that's happening. It's not happening as fast as it ought to. We have a very unfortunate thing in New York City where the city passed the bag fee and then the state overruled it. The state did rescinded or reversed what the city did. But they're not doing it for Suffolk County. Uh, so here's what people can do. Try not to use plastic for shopping bags or bottles. Wear natural fibers rather than synthetics. Refuse the straw or better tell them ahead of time you don't want one. Ask restaurants if you have takeout for compostable packaging instead of styrofoam. Uh, consumer products, plastic bags again, styrofoam, and clean up. Clean up on uh, beaches and also help recover lost fishing gear. So people can do stuff on this one.